Mark chapter 7, verse number 1, the Bible reads, Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be which they have received to hold, as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels, and of tables. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashing hands? Now here, the Bible is talking about all of these rules and all of these little nitpicky regulations that the Jews and especially the Pharisees kept that were not found in the Bible. They weren't found in the Word of God. These were just the traditions of the elders. And these uh, rabbis basically are imposing these traditional things that they've received from the elders. They're trying to impose that on Jesus' disciples and say, hey, they're eating with defiled hands because they didn't wash their hands. When in reality, there's nothing in the Old Testament scripture that tells you that you have to wash your hands every time you're going to eat. Now, uh, these people are rejecting the word of God, Jesus tells them a little later, and choosing rather to go with these traditions that they received from the Pharisees. Now, the Bible has a lot of rules in it, doesn't it? I mean, just in the first five books alone, there are many hundreds of commandments, but let alone all the commandments in the rest of the Old Testament. The New Testament is filled with commandments, there are enough commandments in the Bible where we should not add other commandments and enforce them upon people that are not in the Bible. And I think a key verse for this, if you're reading a King James Bible, is in Ecclesiastes when God says, Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. What does it mean to be the whole duty? It means that that's it. If you fear God and keep his commandments, that's all that God expects of you to do. He doesn't expect you to do a bunch of other things beyond what he's commanded you in this book. Everything that we are commanded to do and commanded not to do is found in the Bible. Now, we might have other rules for ourselves that we make up, and there's nothing wrong with making up rules for yourself. And there's nothing wrong with making up rules for your family. As the man of the house, you might have certain rules in your family that have nothing to do with the Bible, and there's nothing wrong with you making rules. But you should not teach for commandments the doctrines of men. There should be a difference between that which is your rule and your preference and your tradition and the commandment of God. Because my rules and my preferences are for me, but I can't impose that upon you. But when it comes to the commandments of God, I should preach that for everybody, okay? But there's a difference between what God has told us to do and between just people making up their own nitpicky rules that go beyond that. And there are enough rules in the Bible where we don't need to add more rules. There's enough here. And we should just worry about keeping these rules. But let's keep reading here what Jesus answers these guys because they're rebuking Jesus and saying, your disciples are not walking according to the tradition of the elders, but they eat bread with unwashed hands. Verse six, it says, he answered and said unto them, well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Those are some very strong words out of the mouth of Jesus. He's saying, first of all, you're hypocrites. And he says, second of all, your heart is far from God. You're just doing lip service and pretending that you are interested in what God thinks of you, but you're really not. Let's keep reading. It says in verse eight, for laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and many other such like things ye do. Now, I want to point out here that they had not added extra rules to the commandment of God, but rather the Bible says in verse 8 that they laid aside the commandment of God in order to keep their tradition. And let me tell you something. This is true of Judaism today. And people that are Christians, for some reason, have this weird idea that Judaism today, or that the Jews today, believe and follow the Old Testament, and it's a lie. It wasn't even true in Jesus' day. 
And it's even less true in 2014 to say that the Jews believe and follow the Old Testament. They don't. Now, these rules that Jesus is rebuking, all the many such things, the washing of cups and pots, today those things are known as the Talmud. And here's what the Talmud is. I'm just going to explain it to you quickly because that's exactly what Jesus is, is against here. The Talmud is what the Jews call the oral Torah. And here's what they say. Well, the Bible is the written Torah, but then there's the oral Torah. So they say that when Moses was on Mount Sinai, God gave him all the words that would become Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's the written law of God, the written Torah. But the Jews claim that God also just told him a bunch of oral stuff that just never got written down. It was just stuff that he told Moses, and it was like, don't write this down, just, just talk about this, just pass this on verbally, just only write that as, but you know what, it's a lie, because everything that God commanded Moses is in this book right here. Everything he commanded, and the Bible says, he spake all these words and he spake no more unto them. I mean, everything that God commanded Moses is all right here. And they were told, you know, read all the words of Moses, all the words of the law of God unto Moses. But they claim, no, 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 there was this other really nitpicky, really specific stuff that God told Moses, basically explaining and expanding upon what's in the Bible. So, for example, you know, the Bible tells you not to work on the Sabbath day, right? But that's just way too simple. So the Talmud just has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages explaining exactly what you can and can't do on the Sabbath day. So they add all these other nitpicky regulations and things. And so that's that, that is what they call the oral Torah. Now, this didn't used to be written down. It was just passed on from person to person. Now, the true story is that this teaching originated around 200 B.C. It doesn't go all the way back to Moses, of course because everything that God told Moses is in the Bible. But actually, these teachings originated around 200 B.C., and that's why we see Jesus Christ dealing with it, because it was already on the scene when he was there in an oral form. Well, later on, after the Jews were kicked out of the Promised Land, and make no mistake about it, they were kicked out of the Promised Land for one reason, because they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew is very clear on that, that that is why the temple was destroyed, and that's why they were thrown out of, of Israel, was because of their rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, when they were thrown out of the Promised Land, they were afraid that they were going to lose all their precious little traditions about washing your hands and cups and stuff. So they didn't want to lose that, so then they started to write it down after they had been scattered abroad after rejecting Jesus Christ. And they started writing it down, and it was, it was fully compiled and written down around A.D. 500, the Babylonian Talmud. So about 500 years after Christ is when it was all written down. And today it's in written form. And it's, an, it's like an encyclopedia. It's, so, it's 38 volumes. It's not just a book like the, the Bible is a book, and hey, these are God's laws. The laws of the Jews are 38 volumes long. And we've even talked to elderly rabbis that have said, well, I've never read the whole thing cover to cover because it's just so much. But I say, is it the word of God? Yep, it's the word of God. <laughs> never even read it cover to cover. And let me tell you something. Judaism today doesn't just add 38 volumes to the, to the word of God. No, I'll tell you what it does. It rejects this book completely and just worships those 38 volumes. And in, according to the Talmud, it's all, it's the rabbis, it's the elders. Remember the traditions of the elders that matter. And in fact, God even takes guidance from the rabbis in the Talmud. Even God listens to the judgments of the rabbis. They decide what's right and wrong. And even God uh, takes orders from them, according to the Talmud. And I've read the passages myself, and that, that's what it says. It's very weird. And it's, it's a really stupid book. I mean, if you actually just sit down and just start reading several pages of the Talmud, it's one of the stupidest things you'll ever read. It's, it's boring. It's lame. It, you know, God's Word has power. And whenever you try to read any of these other scriptures from other religions, they're always weak. You know, you open the Book of Mormon and read a few pages, it's ridiculous. You read a few pages of the Quran, you can tell something's wrong with this. Read a few pages of the Apocrypha. And you're, you're scratching your head about, you know, how, how anybody could think this is scripture. But when you read the Bible, every page of the Bible 
is wonderful, powerful. And, and you say, how do you know the Bible is true? Because it's, it's the power of God's word. Because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So this, this uh, teaching of the Talmud is what Jesus Christ is rebuking here. And make no mistake about it. If you talk to modern day Jewish rabbis, they will say that they're following the religion of the Pharisees. They'll even tell you that. We're Pharisees. Because the Pharisees are the group that became the predominant rabbis after the destruction of the temple and they were scattered everywhere. The, rab the, the Pharisaical rabbis are the ones who took power. And in fact, if you remember the Apostle Paul was trained by Gamaliel before he got saved. Remember he was brought up and taught at the feet of the Pharisee teacher Gamaliel. Gamaliel, same guy, is one of the rabbis of the Talmud. He's one of the main rabbis in the Talmud, revered as being one of their greatest uh, rabbis. But of course, you know, the Apostle Paul said it was all dung that Gamaliel taught him. Remember? Gamaliel had taught him nothing, but he said all those things that were in him when he excelled in the Jews' religion. He said, I excelled in the Jews' religion. He wasn't talking about Christianity, was he? And he said, above many my equals, he said, but what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for crime, I count all things but dung, he said. And those things were worthless unto him once he found uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is what Jesus is rebuking. And that's why Jesus said, if you believed Moses, he said to the Pharisees, you would have believed me, for he spake of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? So that jives perfectly with Jesus saying here that you've laid aside the commandment of God for your tradition. You've rejected the teaching of the Bible and you've embraced the teaching of the Talmud and you've embraced all of these traditions and things that we see washing hands, washing cups, washing pots. And look, if you have a rule that says, hey, I'm going to wash my hands every time I eat, that's fine. But don't say that God commanded that because he didn't. And we need to differentiate between our rules and God's rules. And so Jesus says here in verse 9, he said unto them, Full well you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your own tradition. Then he gives an example. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother. And whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, It is korban, that is to say, a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered. And many such like things do ye. Now you say, well, what is that about? Explain to me the Korban, you know. I, to be honest, I don't really care. Because whatever it was, it was something that Jesus said is, is, is meaningless. It makes the word of God of none effect. It's your tradition. You know what? I'd rather spend my time figuring out what honor thy father and thy mother means. And what, whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. That's the part of the scripture I'm interested in. Not what a bunch of unbelieving, Christ-rejecting Jews were doing in order to ignore what the Bible said. So I'm not going to go get the Talmud and go figure out what Korban means because I don't really care. Because whatever it was, Jesus rebuked it and told them it's, it's worthless and that they need to get back on the word of God. And by the way, this is Jesus teaching the death penalty. Because a lot of people will say, well, you know, in the Old Testament, the death penalty was there. But there are a lot of Christians in 2014 that are against the death penalty. They don't think any crime should receive the death penalty. But here Jesus is reiterating the death penalty. And I believe in the death penalty, even today. I believe that murderers, uh, adulterers, uh, pedophiles, you know, should be put to death. And today in this country, sometimes murderers are put to death, but it's very rarely. And they just made a ruling of the Supreme Court about five, six, seven years ago that said no pedophile can ever be put to death again in the United States. No matter how bad they are, no matter what they do, that they'll never put a pedophile to death. That's ridiculous. You know, every pedophile should be taken out like a dog and shot. Okay? I believe in the death penalty. People say, well, the death penalty doesn't work. Well, if you kill somebody, they're not going to molest any more children. And you know what? Whenever you read about in the paper some child molester it always says, oh, he was arrested back in 2001 for this. Then he was arrested in 2004 for this. Then he was arrested in 2008 for this. Because they just keep letting them out. And then they just rape and abuse more children. It's wicked. And, and you know, we should have no sympathy for these people. Anyone who would harm a child is, is a sick person. 
is a total reprobate. That is a vile affection. That is going after strange flesh. That is not normal for an adult person to be attracted to children. It's disgusting. And so uh, that's why we have so much pedophilia because these uh, pedophiles are just put in prison. And then they get with other people and they, they literally exchange tips on being a pedophile in prison. And then they come out and they do it more. And you say, well, you know, uh, just put them on a registry. No, put them, you know, put them, put them underground. Kill them. And I remember a news story a while back where this guy was in prison and he overheard this other guy that was a, that was a homo. And by the way, homos are pedophiles. There, I said it. But anyway, uh, this guy was in prison. He overheard the, the guy next to him. It was some homo Catholic priest that molested kids or whatever. And he was teaching other inmates how to uh, molest children. So somehow he got, he got into this guy's cell. I read about this in the news a few years ago. You know, when they had opened the doors or whatever. He got into this guy's cell, slammed the door shut, jammed something in the lock so that the guards couldn't get in, and killed the pedophile with his bare hands. And he basically said, you know, I just, this guy's sitting there talking about how he's going to do it when he gets out, and he's teaching other people how to do it. He said, you know, I just felt like, and he said, I felt like God wanted me to do this, you know. Now, look, I'm not saying that we should take the law into our own hands and, and go out and do this. Obviously, we should, you know, let the Lord take care of it, and the law should be taking care of it. I mean, the government should have laws that, that would uh, take care of these things. It's not our job to take it into our own hands. But I'm just saying, that just goes to show you, though, what's going on in prison. That they are in there exchanging tips, and so, you know, when you hear a, a story like that. So a prison just doesn't work. That's why God never uh, taught prison in the Old Testament. He never, it, it was never part of his law. The only punishments were death or a beating or, or paying a fine to the victim. Those are the only punishments that God ever had in his law. But anyway, let's, let's keep reading here. Uh, it talks about the fact that they had made God's word of none effect through their tradition. And it says in verse 14, When he had called all the people unto him, he said unto them, Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand. There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. And he saith unto them, Are ye so without understanding also? Do ye not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him? Because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth into the draft, and pur purging all meats. And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. So what Jesus is saying here when he says, Nothing that cometh into a man can defile him. What he's explaining is that what really defiles us is that which defiles us spiritually, not physically. He's saying that it's not uh, eating dirty food that's going to make you unholy, but it's rather a, a bad thought life that makes you unholy. It's rather the things that you do, such as, you know, evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murder, theft, covetousness. He said, these are the things that defile the man. Covetousness will defile you. Blasphemy will defile you. But he's saying, to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. So what he's trying to do is get their emphasis off of just physical cleanliness and get on to spiritual cleanliness, which is that which really defiles. Now, some people have tried to twist this verse and try to say, well, there's nothing entering into a man that can defile the man, so therefore it's okay for me to drink alcohol, smoke pot. I mean, I've, I've heard this argument. And people have said, you know, nothing that goes into a man can defile a man. You know, there you go, case closed. You know, I can drink, I can smoke pot, I can take drugs, whatever. But obviously that's not what he's saying. And let me just prove that false. The Bible, first of all, talks about the fact that when you drink alcohol, he says, thine eyes shall behold strange women and thy mouth shall utter perverse things. So if you drink alcohol, you're going to do the stuff on this list anyway because the Bible says that if you drink alcohol, your eyes will behold strange women. And isn't that in this list as, you know, uh, evil thoughts, adulteries, an evil eye? Because, you know, if you look on a woman...
to lust after her. You've committed adultery with her already in your heart. So to try to use this verse to justify, or I've heard other people use it just to justify eating all manner of junk food. You know, I mean, you know, quoting this scripture in the McDonald's drive-thru. You know, <laughs> you know, nothing that cometh into the man can defile the man. You know, give me a Big Mac, fries, Diet Coke, whatever other garbage. But honestly, you know, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. And we should glorify God in our body and in our spirit, which are God's. And so we should not put poisonous substances or junk into our body. Just because Jesus says, hey, you know, washing your hands is not the problem. It's, it's getting your mind clean. That's what really needs to happen. But that's different than just saying, well, just take drugs, smoke cigarettes, uh, drink, eat junk food, because there's nothing that can defile you. I mean, that's, you know, you're taking it too far. There, you're, you're, you, you know, that's a little bit of an extreme view of this passage. And it doesn't jive with the rest of Scripture. You know, we need to make sure that whenever we interpret a Scripture, it, 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 it jives with everything else in Scripture. And if Jesus is just saying here, look, you know, worrying about cleanliness is not as important as worrying about keeping your mind clean and that eating with unwashed hands isn't going to kill you, uh, it makes perfect sense. But let's not take it to some extreme of just, yeah, it doesn't matter what I eat. It doesn't matter what I drink. But here's the thing, though. If you eat junk food, it's going to make you sick. It's going to make you unhealthy. It's going to make you overweight or whatever. And so, you know, you need to stay away from that stuff and eat nutritious food. And the Bible has a lot to say about food and drink, etc. But uh, this verse is saying that it's okay to eat without washing your hands. Now, I still wash my hands usually before I eat, especially if I come into contact with a lot of people and, and shake a lot of people's hands. You know, when I was a kid, we used to call it washing off the fellowship before lunch. <laughs> but honestly, uh, there have been a lot of times when I go to work and my hands are dirty, dirty, like with actual dirt, and I'll just eat like that. And honestly, I don't think it's really bad for you because today we live in a little bit of an over-sanitized society because we live in cities and we're very clean and everything's ultra sterile and ultra sanitized. And that may not be the healthiest thing in the world because we don't necessarily develop our immune system if we're just overly clean and overly sanitary. And there have been studies done that have shown that kids who play in the dirt and put a little dirt in their mouth are actually smarter and healthier. You know, that's what I heard. But anyway, <laughs> there's a study for everything, right? But honestly, you know, I, I like to go out and, and kind of be in nature and get a little bit dirty, get some dirt on my feet, dirt on my hands. And if you think about it, I mean, the disciples, they're going around in sandals, their feet are getting dirty. They're in a dusty, dirty place. Like Arizona is the dustiest place I've ever lived. I mean, everything gets dusty and dirty. But there's a difference between just dust and dirt, eating a little dirt and, uh, you know, germs from other people. So we do need to be careful with other people's germs. And the Bible talks a lot about germs and quarantine and stuff like that when people are sick. But honestly, I remember when I, when I used to go uh, dirt bike riding as a kid, I mean, you swallowed a lot of dirt. I mean, your whole face would be covered in dirt, your nostrils, dirt, mouth filled with dirt. And, you know, after that, eating with unwashed hands isn't a big deal anymore. After you just eat, literally get a bunch of dirt in your mouth. But uh, that's what Jesus is saying here. And he lists these things that come out of the heart of men and defile the man. And he says these proceed out of the heart. And he said they defile the man from within. And so what this scripture is teaching us that all of these sins that we see on this list, they all start in our mind. So it's not like people just go through life having good thoughts and a clean mind and a pure attitude, and then all of a sudden they just go out and just rob a store or just commit adultery or just murder someone. I mean, do you really think people just do those kind of things spontaneously? No way. There's a long process of evil thoughts. The Bible says it comes out of the heart and defiles the man. And so long before you, well, let's look at the list here. It says they proceed evil thoughts from the heart. Adulteries. Now, long before you commit adultery, you have a lot of bad thoughts. You don't just go through life, you're happily married, and you love your wife, and you think that she's the greatest thing ever, and you're so happy, and you're content, and then all of a sudden you just, temptation comes, and just boom, you just commit adultery on the spur of the moment. There's no way that that would ever happen. 
not going to happen. I mean, unless somebody's completely drunk or on drugs or something, that's not going to happen. What happens is there goes through a period where people start being down on their spouse, negative about their spouse, and they start thinking that someone else is probably better, there's something better out there, and, you know, why did I marry this person, and blah, blah, blah. And then they start comparing their spouse to other people negatively and thinking that there's something better. And then they start talking bad about their spouse to someone else. And then next thing you know, they're spending a lot of time with somebody of the opposite gender. And at first it's not physical, but then they start, you know, getting closer and more comfortable. And it, it takes people usually probably months from the time that their marriage is starting to go downhill to the time that they're actually going to go out and commit adultery. It doesn't just happen. And people will sometimes lie and say that, oh, yeah, everything was great. And then, you know, I just was tempted and I committed. No, no, that's not true. And a lot, like, I've said this and had people get really angry, but I'm going to say it again because it's the truth, that people who have a happy marriage don't commit adultery. Amen. And, and the reason why people commit adultery is because they have marriage problems. Because there's no reason, here's the thing, if you're happy in your marriage, you're, you have no reason to commit adultery. There's no temptation to commit adultery. You know, it's people that are not getting something that they need in their marriage, so they go looking for it somewhere else. And that could be male or female. You know, they, they're not getting the attention that they want. Whether it's they're not getting the physical relationship that they, that they need out of that marriage, or they're just not getting the emotional, you know, uh, affection and companionship or romance, or whatever it is, they're not getting it. That's why they're looking for it somewhere else. And if you, if you want to eliminate adultery, then have a good marriage. Because if you have a great marriage and love your spouse and they love you and you have a physical relationship with your spouse, then you're not going to be looking somewhere else and neither is your spouse because it's all right there. But the, 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 the failure that leads to adultery is a failure to have the right marriage in the first place. And, and that's the best way to prevent adultery is to have a good marriage. Now, people will sometimes misinterpret that or get angry about that because they'll say, oh, you're, just, you're justifying adultery. You're, you're blaming the victim. But I'm not blaming the victim. I'm just, I'm not justifying it. There's no excuse for adultery. Listen, if your marriage is horrible, you still don't have the right to commit adultery. And adultery is a wicked sin, even if you have an awful marriage, even if it is bad. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I will say this, if you have a horrible marriage, your spouse is a lot more likely to commit adultery than if you have a good marriage. That's just common sense, my friend. Anyone with any brains would tell you that if you treat your spouse poorly, that they're more likely to, to commit adultery than if you treat them well. It doesn't justify it, doesn't make it right, doesn't make an excuse for it, but we would do well to have good marriage. And look, adultery is rampant in America. The statistics on it are crazy, off the charts. It's like one out of three people are committing adultery today in America. Have, 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 have uh, been married and, and gone outside of the marriage. And, and cheated on their spouse. It's, it's, it's horrible. But I'll tell you part of the reason why is because marriages are, are in horrible shape today. That's a big part of it. Because Jesus said that these things that defile you, they come from the heart of man. They come out of the heart where evil thoughts creep in. And then another thing that he lists a little bit further on is covetousness. And one of the major sins associated with adultery is covetousness. The Bible says... Uh, marriage is honorable and all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetousness, the Bible says, right back to back. Just like in the commandments when he says, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. That's one of the main things that he brings up as what you are not to covet. And so what leads to adultery according to Jesus Christ? Covetousness, evil thoughts. Okay, looking at someone else and thinking that they're better than what you have, not being content with what you have. And so uh, we, we in America today have a twisted view of marriage, and that's why marriages are bad, and that's why there's so much adultery. Because if you have a bad marriage, then adultery is a possibility. You know, God forbid. Uh, but, and it doesn't excuse it, but it's just a reality that, that's going to uh, be possible if 
you have a bad marriage. Now, I don't have time to preach a whole sermon on marriage, but the fault lies in churches today because the Bible is actually really clear on what a marriage is supposed to look like. It's actually very clear. It's not like God wasn't really clear enough and God was a little bit vague and so people are confused. The Bible's crystal clear. And one of the big things that the Bible teaches is that the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church and that as the church is supposed to be subject unto Christ, so are the wives to be subject unto their own husbands in everything. In everything. That's what the Bible says. So the Bible's really good. I mean, the Bible says, even as Sarah also, who obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. The Bible says that the wives are to be taught to be good, to be chaste, to be keepers at home, and it says to be obedient to their own husbands. So th the Bible is so clear, but here's the thing. Is that what American marriage looks like today? Wives that are obedient to their husbands? The husband, the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church? Is that what we see today in marriages? No. And sure, there are lots of other pieces of marriage advice that we find in the Bible and a lot of other things that we could teach. But you know, the big elephant in the room is that wives aren't obeying their husbands today. And, and that's the problem. Because, and, and you say, well, you're blaming the wives. No, I'm blaming the husbands. Because, the, you know, we're stronger than women anyway. So, you know, we, we can't really blame the feminazis for taking over America. And, and, and basically, you know, the, all their women's rights, I am woman, hear me roar, you know, because we as men have allowed it to happen in America today. And especially pastors have, pastors have not had the guts to get up and preach this like it should be preached, like the Bible preaches it. So because pastors haven't had the guts to preach it, and because husbands haven't had the guts to take the bull by the horns in their own home and actually confront this issue, and actually take the lead and take charge in their home, you know, it's not, I, I can't blame the, the weaker vessel. I can't blame, you know, it's, it's, it's really men at the end of the day who hold the responsibility to lead and take charge and to be the boss. But honestly, uh, I, I blame pastors more than anything because, you know, I grew up my whole life and never heard strong preaching on, on uh, husband leadership. You just don't hear it because it's not popular. But I don't care if it's popular. I, I'd rather have half the church walk out and be, and be in charge of my home. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's nuts to it. Because you know what? My wife and kids are more important to me than being pastor of this church. You know, and I'm going to stand for, and, and by the way, I'd rather help people's marriages and lose people along the way. Because you know what? The people who actually get what I'm saying and actually get, you know, and this isn't a whole sermon on marriage, but when I do whole sermons on marriage and go through all the scriptures, the people who actually get it and put it into practice, it actually helps their marriage a lot. And they're actually, husband and wife are both a lot happier Amen. and have a better relationship. And everybody uh, is blessed as a result. So you know what? I'd rather help people and do that than to be popular and then to have a big crowd. I'd rather actually just help some people have a better marriage and, 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 and to have my own marriage be right. That's more important to me. So here we see adultery begins in the heart, in the mind. Obviously, fornication, same thing. You know, fornication is premeditated, of course. Uh, you know, yes, you can fall into certain situations, but, you know, it comes from putting yourself in those situations, lusting and, and thinking about those things. And, you know, it, it's hard today. It's hard to be pure today. It's hard for, for young people not to commit fornication because of the fact that there's so much temptation out there and because it's just, everything is crammed down our throat, just the promiscuity everywhere. So it would be easier for a young man or a young lady to stay pure if it was kind of out of sight, out of mind. You know what I mean? If you're just kind of busy living your life, doing other things, but it, it, basically we're constantly forced to think about what goes on in the bedroom just because of just billboards and magazines and TV and everything where it's just kind of pushed on us and it makes it hard to be pure. But let me tell you something, that is not an excuse for fornication. And it, 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 it's difficult to be pure, but it is not impossible. It is possible for a young person to be a virgin on their wedding day. It's, I've done it, okay? When I got married, I was a virgin and you know what? I've been with one woman in my entire life, and hopefully I will go to the grave having been with one woman 
in my entire life because it is possible. But let me tell you, it was hard. It was challenging to grow up in, in America in the 21st century. And it, well, that was the 20th century when I was, when I was coming up, you know, because I got married in the year uh, 2000. So, but I'm telling you, it was hard. It was a challenge because it's just, it's constantly in front of you, right? You're constantly just being shown all these images that, that provoke you to lust. And it's hard to, to resist the temptation, but that's no excuse. It's just as big of a sin now as it was when this was written. And the Bible over and over again rails against fornication. And, over, and he even said that those who just continue in fornication, if they're called a brother, should be put out of the church. You know, so this is a major, big sin, not something small to be trifled with. And, 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 to sit there, and I've had people just say, well, it's just not realistic today, though. But I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Amen. And you know what? You got it, guys. You know, I believe that the Bible teaches it's better to marry than to burn. You know, and the Bible teaches that to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every wo woman have her own husband to avoid fornication. So the, the, the answer to avoiding fornication is to get married. That's what the Bible teaches. Now, obviously, when you're a teenager, that's not practical because, you know, you're, you're, you're still too young and you're, you're, you're uh, still getting established as an adult and everything. And so you need, to be and you need to be abstaining as a teenager. And you just need to exercise self-control and wait until you're an adult. And then just because you're an adult, you might not necessarily find the right person right away. But you need to pray that God will lead you to the right person. And listen, guys, you actually have to talk to girls. You know, you, you, know, you can't just expect it to fall out of the sky. You know, you have to actually go out and look for it, okay? And so you need to go out and, and, and meet people and work toward that because honestly, living as a single guy is dangerous. If, if you're one that that's, uh, has a strong urge in that area, you know, you need to get married. That's the best way to do it. And of course, many churches and many sectors of our society will discourage you from getting married. And they want you to be 30 when you get married and, you know, or they want you to at least wait until you finish this or finish that or whatever. But you know what? I, I think getting married young is a good thing in today's society. Now, I'm not saying to rush out and just marry the first person that comes along. But honestly, there's nothing wrong with getting married. You know, if you, if you can find a godly person to get married to, there's nothing wrong with getting married young. You know, and it, it's actually good for you. You say, well, you know, you got to go live life. But you know what? Y your life is not over when you get married. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's not like that's it. Life's over. It was fun. Now it's just time to begin the suffering phase. <laughs> You know, <laughs> you know, you can still enjoy life after you get married. But honestly, uh, when, I, when my parents were getting married, my, when my parents got married, my dad was 20 and my mom was 19. And that was normal back then. I mean, that was just what everybody was doing. I wasn't considered. But then when I got married when I was 19, everybody's like, whoa, what are you doing? You're getting married, you're 19. Or uh, Pastor Roger Jimenez in Sacramento, California, he got married when he was 18. Whoa, what are you doing? Well, you know what? Isn't it amazing how he's serving God? You know, and he hasn't gone off the deep end, and he's married and has children and, and doing a good work for God. But then there are some of the other people who didn't get married in the same church youth group that just kind of went off and floated around in their single years and whatever and, and got away from the Lord and got backslidden and everything else. So in a sense, getting married sometimes kind of keeps you straight anyway, you know, and keeps you on the right path with, with God because it's responsibility. It's good for you. But, you know, God says here, uh, evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts. You know, uh, obviously murder begins with hatred in your heart for someone. Thefts, be that, that begins with coveting and lusting after things that don't belong to you. Lasciviousness, uh, what, or I skipped one here, wickedness, deceit lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile the man. So that's what Jesus is teaching, that we need to get our heart right, because if we cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter, the outside will be clean also. And if we have a clean heart and a clean mind, and if we think the right thoughts about our spouse, then we're not going to fall into this stuff, because we have a, a good thought life. It's very important that our heart is right.